Well, first, let me thank those who have invited me here and uh, how much I appreciate it. I've been wanting to visit Beeson for a very long time and I'm delighted to be here with you. Thank you, Dr. Cole, for your uh, introduction. And indeed, uh, we worked as colleagues at one time and, uh, as he says, a very, very happy experience indeed. And it's good to see him again. Uh, I thought I'd talk to you today about a subject of engrossing interest to at least one person in the room, namely me. I thought I'd talk about myself. Uh, most of us find ourselves to be of engrossing interest, and I think I'm interesting to me. Uh, I am the General Secretary of GAFCON, and I'll get to that in due course, but it's because it's me that I'll get to it, if you follow me. I'm hoping you'll be interested in me as well. Uh, I am an Anglican. That is true. I am a birth Anglican. I was brought up in an Anglican church in the Diocese of Sydney, but an Anglican church, or it used to be called the Church of England. The name change is not insignificant. Uh, that is true. Uh, I am also, by conviction, an evangelical Christian, uh, particularly in the, in the sort of the British tradition of evangelical. Uh, and uh, certainly that has been the way in which uh, I have grown as a Christian and commit myself as a Christian. So I am an Anglican and I am an evangelical. My first question is how we bring those two words together. Am I an Anglican who is an evangelical, or am I an evangelical who is an Anglican? Which of those two? Now, it does matter. I am, am I an Anglican first and an evangelical second, or am I an evangelical first and an Anglican second? Now, you may not be Anglican, I realise that. Some here will be, others most won't be. But it's the same question. Uh, presumably, uh, many of us at least will be members of denominations, denominational Christianity, some may be independent, but most of us will be members of a denominational Christianity. Are we first and foremost Presbyterian, who happen to be evangelical, or evangelicals who happen to be Presbyterians? Uh, this is not an unimportant question for the way in which you intend to conduct your ministry. And I hope uh, that uh, my own personal story here, in which I'm intensely interested, will make you reflect upon your own personal story, in which you are intensely interested, and between us we'll have a very interesting time. Uh, that would be good. So which is it to be? Now, I have to explain to you the uh, origins of Christianity in Australia, uh, from which I come. Uh, the origins of Australia, we prefer not to talk about, um, <laughs> the origins, that is to say, of white settlement in Australia which is in 1788 and was, uh, arose from uh, certain events here in the United States or the, in the United States when the British were no longer able to send their, uh, some of their citizens to you uh, who happened to be criminals. Uh, looking for another penal colony, uh, they settled upon this new land, the, new to them, uh, and they sent a whole fleet of 13 ships loaded with soldiers and with convicts uh, to Australia and simply disembarked them uh, in this very, very far away place. It was an extraordinary uh, effort on their part. Very few people died on the voyage. No ships were lost. All this was extraordinary. Uh, but there they were uh, in what is now modern Sydney. Convicts, soldiers. Difficult to tell the difference. Uh, later on, the and it was difficult to tell the difference. It was a, it was a very uh, disorderly, unprepossessing, pretty scoundrelly way to begin a nation. Uh, and we've never got beyond it, uh, as you can see. Could God be in this? Well, I'll tell you what God did. When the fleet was being planned, there was a politician and a minister of the gospel who got together, thought about the whole thing, and used their influence. They used their influence to make sure that on the first fleet there was an Anglican chaplain. That made sense, or a Church of England chaplain. That was easy enough to secure. But they made sure that he was an evangelical Anglican chaplain. Uh, the name of the politician might be familiar to you. His name is William Wilberforce. You may have heard of him, I think. 
And the name of the clergyman was John Amazing Grace Newton. So it's all very well for you to scorn and scoff at the beginnings of Australian settlement, white settlement, but at the very beginnings were Wilberforce and Newton. Thank you very much. You do better than that. <laughs> well, why? The man they chose was Richard Johnson. He was married to a uh, woman called Mary. So Richard and Mary Johnson set out and came with that first fleet. Their adventures I won't retail here. They had a miserable time. But they stayed. And we actually know the very place and the text of the first sermon preached in Australia. The first Christian sermon preached in Australia. Well, what were they thinking of? This was not a mere, let's make sure the convicts hear the gospel. No. Newton and Wilberforce had a vision. They had a vision for this great new land where they knew they were Aboriginal inhabitants to be evangelised, but they also had a vision for the whole of the South Pacific. They believed, you see, that from this new settlement would go the gospel out into the islands of the South Pacific. And Newton even wrote a little hymn for... Johnson to carry with him, which talks about him being, uh, or this being the beginnings of a, of a sort of apostolic work in the South Pacific. Johnson and Wilberforce were men of vision, zeal, enthusiasm. They were filled with the gospel and they made sure that the gospel was incorporated into the story of white settlement in Australia and beyond. It was only uh, a few years later, on Christmas Day, 1814, that the successor to Richard Johnson, a man called Samuel Marsden, also a Yorkshireman, uh, at great personal cost and great personal expense, uh, went to New Zealand. And on Christmas Day, 1814, we know the spot, we know the sermon. He preached the first Christian sermon in New Zealand. And so Wilberforce and Newton's great vision begins to be fulfilled as the gospel goes forth. Be nice to think there was a Wilberforce in the room. Be nice to think there was a Newton in the room. Not just for the things that they're famous for, but the things that we don't even know about, like this great vision that they had for global Christian evangelization. Why am I telling you the story? Because I'm the, I'm the product of the story. Because they did that, the foundation of uh, modern Australia had evangelical Anglicanism right at its roots here, and it grew and grew and grew. It, it had its ups and had its downs. There was a very fortunate death at one point of a bishop, thank God. Uh, but it, then they got a really good bishop, and in the end, in the end, uh, more than a third, more like a half of the church-going Anglicans in Australia are evangelicals. And certainly the growing parts, the growing parts in modern Australia uh, are the evangelical Anglicans to this very day. And we've heard about more college, and there's Ridley College as well, where Graham was the principal, and other colleges as well around Australia. It's a great thing. And, of course, the gospel in New Zealand likewise. Now, I'm the son of a crook. Uh, you don't say that lightly. Um, uh, well, son means uh, my great 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 grandfather was a crook. Um, that is to say, his name was William Pascoe Crook. Uh, and he came to Australia in the first years after the colony. He was only a sort of um, um, tradesman, but he came as a London Missionary Society missionary. And he uh, ministered in Tahiti, where his name is even now famous. And I mention that because here again is the fulfilment of the vision of Wilberforce and Newton, who were convinced that the gospel needed to go to all the world. Is there a Wilberforce in the room? Is there a Newton in the room? We were so blessed. From Britain came the gospel. And even today, those of us, well, certainly like me, feel a, a great affection for Britain, 
and for the gospel that came to us from the English people uh, and uh, came with that first fleet. Still, I must move on autobiographically. Uh, the next blessing that came to Australia, um, well, me really, uh, was the visit in 1959 of an American. His name may be familiar to you, it was Billy Graham. You may have heard of him. Uh, and Billy Graham came in 1959 at the invitation. Now, this is tricky. I don't know if you realise this, but Billy Graham would not be popular with all Anglicans. Did you realise that? Uh, when he came to England in 1954, and very successful, under God, crusades in England, uh, many in the Church of England opposed his coming or refused to support his coming. Uh, getting bishops to support Billy Graham in England was very difficult. One did. He later became the Archbishop of Sydney. <laughs> very difficult to get any support from the Church of England, uh, from the hierarchy. When he came to Australia, one of the leaders of those who invited him to Australia was the Anglican Archbishop of Sydney. Inviting an American Baptist to, to come and preach the gospel in Australia. What was he thinking of? And some of the bishops in Australia, the other bishops, wrote tracts about it and opposed Billy Graham and his preaching of the gospel. They regarded it as horrible that this American should come and preach and ask people to come forward and all that sort of stuff. They opposed it. But the Archbishop of Sydney, a man called Howard Mull, You know what he was? He was an evangelical first and an Anglican second. It mattered. Because he was able to bring together through his leadership the evangelicals from all the denominations. And they combined the Salvation Army and the, and the Methodists and the Presbyterians. They all combined to welcome Billy Graham and to put on the Crusades. It was a great evangelical moment, led by an Anglican. And Mr. Graham came, preached the gospel, uh, and uh, I was converted. My brother was converted. My wife went forward of the crusade, and, uh, and she knew the Lord already, but she took the crusade movement to go forward. Fifty years later, she discovered that her going forward had led to the conversion of another little girl that was a little girl then. And so it went on. Thank you, Americans, for Mr. Graham, who came and preached the gospel with such effect. And I'm a product of that preaching. But he wasn't an Anglican. Don't know what to make of that. Could he really do good if he wasn't an Anglican? After all, I'm an Anglican. Well, the thing about Billy is, I beg your pardon, Mr. Graham is, he's an evangelical. He preached the same gospel. Mind you, I think he's Arminian. Um, he may be Calvinistic, I don't know. But you see, evangelicals have managed to bring that one together <laughs> because we're surround, we're, we're, we, are, we are committed to the authority of God's word, the need for the gospel to be preached, for souls to be saved, for the cross to be at the centre of our preaching, for people to come to know the Lord through repentance and faith and a world mission. That's the people we are. Well, am I an Anglican first or an Evangelical first? Theologically, I don't have to choose, thank goodness. Uh, if you look back into... Uh, the Anglicanism that we inherited in Australia, uh, it is very, very firmly grounded in the Reformation. Uh, ours are the martyrs. Uh, ours are Thomas Cramner and William Tyndale and all the others who were martyred. Uh, ours are the great prayer books of the Reformation. Uh, ours are the Confession of Faith of the Reformation, the 39 Articles. Uh, these, uh, these great Reformation documents uh, are thoroughly consistent with an evangelical view, properly understood, uh, of 
Christianity. The Reformation was nothing if it wasn't an evangelical movement. Now, we use the word evangelical in different ways, and, and we often use it of the great 18th century movement to do with Wesley, Whitfield, and so forth. But fundamentally, the Anglican Church is evangelical in its confession of faith, in its liturgy, in its history. And so theologically, uh, I've never felt the need to choose. It doesn't mean that I don't think other people are thoroughly going evangelicals in other denominations, but I'm saying for my own denomination, I never felt that as an evangelical I had to leave the Anglican Church. It, on the contrary, I felt the Anglican Church uh, sustained my evangelicalism, properly understood. Strategically, of course, strategically the issue is, however, how important is our denomination? I know we use the word church of something like the Anglican Church, but I have hesitations about that, I have to say. Uh, for me, as an Anglican, I believe that the locus of the church is uh, around the Lord Jesus Christ, and I believe the expressions of the church are in the great local churches where the word of God is preached to faithful men and women and the sacraments duly administered. Uh, I see that the word church is, I'm not going to create a fuss about it, but it's sometimes useful to remind ourselves that something like the Anglican Church is, is scarcely a scriptural concept. Uh, it can grow out of scripture. The connection and connectedness of churches, of local churches, is not unscriptural, and you can see the beginnings of it in scripture. I'm not opposed to the idea, but sometimes we use the word church in such a sort of a imperialistic way of the institutional establishment uh, what should we say, denominational churches, that it swallows up the local church and makes us forget about the great church, the true church, the one church of Jesus Christ gathered around him of the saints living and dead. This is an important point to make because sometimes you've got to choose between your... Occasionally, I have rarely had to do this personally, but sometimes one must choose between one's denomination and the gospel. It happens sometimes so if you move and you've got to find a new church and no church anywhere near you is one that preaches a recognisable gospel. It may go under the name Anglican. It may go under any sort of denominational flagship. But I take it that uh, our advice to people is to look certainly for an Anglican church. If you're an Anglican, of course. But fundamentally for a church in which the gospel of the Lord Jesus Christ is preached where Christ rules over his church by the, his word, where people gather in order to meet the Lord Jesus Christ in his word and by the power of his spirit in the fellowship of one another and where you can see faith, hope and love. That's church. And it may, one trusts it will go under the Anglican uh, flag, but it doesn't always. And when the choice is made, I trust that you would choose the evangelical church. Don't get me wrong, I'd first go to the Anglicans because I'm an Anglican. But sometimes you have to say denomination is less important than gospel. It means too that I will readily join with other evangelicals in all sorts of Christian ministries. In, uh, in my part of the world, uh, what you, the Scripture Union for example, the InterVarsity and all other sorts of ministries in which I'm very happy indeed to mix and to work with and to collaborate with fellow evangelicals in preaching the gospel. Yes, it's true that I collaborate with Christians from other denominations too. And so when I was Archbishop of Sydney, I collaborated with the Roman Catholic Archbishop of Sydney on certain points, but not at points at which the gospel, which divides us, was obscured. Not there. So there is a point in collaboration, there is a point in fellowshipping, but one needs to ask yourself, is the gospel going to be obscured by this collaboration? And then one must hold back. Well, still talking about me, as you can see, I'm thoroughly interested in myself. Let me say, therefore, and you've guessed, that when the question comes, am I an evangelical first or an Anglican first, I say I'm an evangelical first. But I don't see the tension, except in 
rare circumstances, and I see the outworking of it is in fellowshipping with other evangelicals and not allowing the word Anglican, as the hierarchy in England did in 1954, to stand in the way of fellowshipping with evangelicals. Now, Graham has kindly, uh, Dr. Cole has kindly told me, told you that I am the general secretary of a movement called GAFCON. And I'd like to acknowledge the presence of Canon Phil Ashey here, by the way, who's a fellow uh, soldier in this movement and to whom uh, I'm personally much indebted. Uh, and I'm glad that he's here today. GAFCON involves Global Anglican Future Conference was summoned into existence because of a crisis in the Anglican Communion. Now, <coughs> Dr. Cole indicated how significant the Anglican Communion is for world Christianity, with its large millions of members connected through being Anglicans. Uh, it is indeed very significant. And I think my time as Archbishop of Sydney, when I had to move in the wider circles, convinced me, as I hadn't been shown before, just how significant it is. It is, not something to be, uh, it is not something to be downplayed as un insignificant. Uh, Anglicans tend to have what we call national churches, using the word church as the very broad sense. We don't think of the Anglican church worldwide. We think of the Anglican communion or Anglican fellowship of churches worldwide. And there are many things that draw us together. There's our history. There's our articles of religion. There's our prayer book. There's all sorts of things that bring us together. Uh, but the thing that actually brings people together and brings, say, the bishops of the Anglican community together is the precedence given to the Archbishop of Canterbury. He's not the Pope. He doesn't have any legal role. Uh, but he has an authority of, of history on his side and venerableness of office. And uh, he has the capacity to summon the bishops. And every year since 1867, every 10 years since 1867, the Archbishop of Canterbury would summon the bishops together in a conference, a famous conference called the Lambeth Conference. Every bishop wanted to go to the Lambeth Conference. It was great. You got to meet the Queen. It was really terrific. So you can imagine how I feel when I didn't go. No, imagine how my wife felt when we didn't go. <laughs> she still talks about it. <laughs> well, why wouldn't you go? Why would you hold back from going to one of the really plus things about being bishop? We couldn't go. In 2008, 1998, I should say, there was, a, there was a motion passed at the Lambeth Conference. It's only a moral authority, but it said it, it condemned the practice of homosexuality, the practice of homosexuality, as being inconsistent with the Bible. And then in 2003, the American branch of the Anglican Church, if you like, the tech, consecrated an actively homosexual bishop. This precipitated, as you could imagine, a crisis. Uh, many there were all around the communion who felt that this was totally inappropriate. They, 1998 had been passed overwhelmingly the other way, but the Americans simply went ahead. They simply went ahead and did it. This precipitated uh, many discussions and there was much calling for repentance. For we wish repentance, we wish reconciliation, but no repentance came. And so in 2008, the Archbishop of Canterbury was put in the awkward situation of having to summon together the bishops from all around the Anglican Communion. And who was he going to summon? Well, he decided he wouldn't summon Bishop Robinson. But what about the people who had made Bishop Robinson a bishop? And he wasn't going to summon, he wasn't going to summon anyone who had crossed boundaries in order to help other people. No, he wouldn't do that. So he didn't invite Bishop Minns, who was an American, uh, American who was, had been Episcopalian and now made a bishop of the Nigerian church in order to help Anglicans in North. No, he didn't invite him, but he invited... Can I say that the, particularly the African Christians, but also Asian, South American, and many of us elsewhere too, See, I don't know what you think about this issue. I hope I do. Is the church, is the church of Jesus Christ, is he the head of the church? And does he rule the church through his word? And does his word not condemn, among other things, greed, fornication? 
but including in that the practice of homosexuality? Has that not always been our understanding of the Word of God? And is it not still our understanding of the Word of God when we look back into it? Is it not the understanding of the Word of God that complete liberals have? And they say, yes, that's true, it does say that. Just don't go down there. And there was a sense, and there was a sense particularly, and here's where I come to the, my experience of the broader church, there was a sense particularly amongst the African Christians. There are 13 and a half active Anglican Christians in Uganda. There are 20 million African and Nigerian active Anglicans. There are about a million in England, about 200,000 in Australia. They felt betrayed. You gave us the gospel. You gave us the Bible. We had to give up our animism. We had to give up our original religion. We had to give up polygamy. You summoned us to a totally new way of life. And we did it at great cost including martyrdom. And now you tell us that the Bible is no longer the ruling principle of your church. I have sat with some of those brothers. Brothers they are because they were the leading primates and Anglican bishops. I have sat with some of them. I don't say they wept tears but they wept inside themselves, as you could hear, because of the betrayal of the West. And it was they who said, we'll not go to Lambeth. We cannot sit down at the holy table with those who have consecrated a bishop in direct contravention to the word of God. And so they withdrew from Lambeth, a third of the bishops, 300 out of 900, and we met. Where would we meet? Where could we go? If we weren't going to where sort of Anglicanism had its origin, its home, Britain, we, we love Britain. That's where the gospel came from. If we're not going to go there, where will we go? And we went to Jerusalem. And it was the second most extraordinary week of my life. As Christians from America, Canada, New Zealand, Australia, England, Scotland, Wales, Ireland, met with their brothers and sisters. It wasn't just bishops. That's old-fashioned stuff, isn't it? This was a future conference. I had a bit to do with organising it and I had the uh, communique already written before the conference began. No point trying to write it during the conference. You might get it wrong. Uh, so I had the communique already written. Um, and Archbishop Akanola of Nigeria, who was the boss, announced on the first... I think he knew. And he announced on the first Sunday, put away all communiques. We are going to write something during the conference. Impossible if you know how conferences work. And God did it. And we produced a document called the Jerusalem Statement and Jerusalem Declaration, which I ask you to read, which announced to all the world that for us Anglicans, the gospel came first. And this was not just evangelical Anglicans, let me say. This was Orthodox Anglicans, Anglo-Catholics, what used to be called broad church Anglicans, Anglicans from all the different charismatics, Anglicans from all the traditions were there, which rather shocked my dear evangelical soul. <laughs> but I managed, because these were the ones who were going to stand for the Bible and the gospel and the orthodox faith. And when in the end Henry Lucan Rombi, the Archbishop of Uganda, stood and read the document and people 
rose to their feet spontaneously and And when we knew through this document that the American Christians who had had to leave their original church because they could not stay in it were going to be recognised and authenticated by the Africans because the English wouldn't do it, the English hierarchy wouldn't do it, then we knew a new day had dawned. And so was born the Anglican Church in North America. And so will be born other churches. Well, is this important? Oh, yes. Pretty big group, 80 million. But this is going on in other, all the mainstream denominations are faced with exactly the same thing. We're now living in the post-Christian world. Are we going to come to terms with the culture and submit to its dictates? Or are we going to do as the early Christians did and stand for Christ and the gospel in the face of a hostile world? That is the painful choice which we are now to make. And it's being made in all the denominations. Well, quickly, and then I'll see if there are any questions. What I want to say then is Anglicanism is evangelical in its roots. Yes, there are others within the Anglican movement who may not call themselves evangelicals, and that's fine. But I'm glad to be an Anglican because I believe if you go back to its Reformation roots, I'm thoroughly at peace there. Anglicanism is, is worldwide. Uh, I don't know, if I was a member of a small independent Bible church, that's fine. But you miss something. You miss being connected to this worldwide movement, which is so significant and at the moment is open. We have an opportunity here to do something great for Christ because certain people, led by the Africans, have made a stand for Christ. Anglicanism around the world is largely evangelical. There, there are other movements in the Anglican Church, but much of the growth of the, Anglic of the Anglican Church around the world has been evangelical, and therefore, I find that I can minister easily within it. Anglicanism is under threat over the authority of Scripture. And so are you if you're in a denomination, almost certainly. And what I also discovered was, yes, I'm an evangelical person, an Anglican second, but just in order to save my bacon with uh, Canon Ashy here, let me say, with whom I'm having fun, Strategically, as an evangelical first and an Anglican second, I have found, particularly through my time as Archbishop and also being the global, uh, General Secretary of GAFCON, which includes people from all different branches and types of Anglicans, that because of the crisis we've been through and the stand for the authority of Scripture, we can and must collaborate with Anglicans of all types as long as they are orthodox. Bible people. And even though I've found it difficult because I'm such a colonial, and such a sort of a small, small town boy, really, I've found it possible. And it has been a wonderful privilege to mix with Anglicans of all sorts as an evangelical. <laughs>